read about the, the Buddha's path in books at all. It's very laid out in nice, logical steps. One step building, building up to another one, leading up to another one. And it all makes perfect sense. You develop virtue, you develop concentration, and then based on the concentration you develop discernment. You need the virtue for good powers of concentration because it helps you lead a life in which there are no regrets. You don't do anything harmful to yourself, you don't do anything harmful to other people. And as a result, when the time comes to settle down and get the mind still in the present moment, it's very easy. You're not disturbed by memories of the past where you harmed this person or did something harmful to yourself. So you're neither bothered by regrets and you're not, you don't start lying to yourself with denial and the things that you try to cover up from yourself. So when, the, when you've got a clear conscience like this, it's easy for the mind to settle down. And it's the same with the connection between concentration and discernment. Once the mind is still, it makes sense it's just to see things a lot more clearly. When there's a sense of well-being that comes when you can be on friendly terms with your breath. Breath comes in, the breath goes out, you stay with the breath, the mind relates well with the breath. There's a sense of well-being that comes from the present moment like this. And then it's easier to deal with some of the more difficult issues that come up in the mind. Things where you tend to ordinarily tend to lie to yourself or cover things up. But once the mind is in a good mood like this, when it has a good friend in the breath, it feels stronger and it's willing to admit to itself truths about itself that it ordinarily wouldn't admit, couldn't stand to hear, couldn't stand to see. In this way the mind gains insight that leads to release. So it all makes sense laying it out like this. The problem is our minds don't make sense. They don't necessarily follow easy paths like this, and our lives don't follow sequential paths like this either. We can't wait until we have really perfect virtue before we're going to start working on concentration. We can't wait until our concentration is strong to deal with some issues, because they come up in the midst of life. And so what we do is we have to learn how to make use of what we've got in terms of our virtue, in terms of our concentration, and in terms of our discernment. Put them to use. Put them all to use at whatever level they are. And that way, no matter how weak they are, through exercise they get stronger. It's like the body. You exercise. How are you going to get a strong body? Well, you take the weak body you have and you exercise it. And through exercise it becomes strong. So you take whatever virtue, concentration, and discernment you have and you apply them to the problems of life as they arise. And it's good to th keep things basic. All too often we like to head off into advanced Buddha's philosophy right away. And it doesn't have any grounding. And we tend to get lost in the abstractions. And so it's good to keep in touch with the beginnings. What are the beginnings? Well, there's one passage where the Buddha says, Give me someone who's honest, who's no deceiver, and I will teach that person the Dharma. Okay, first quality you need and as you practice the Dharma is honesty. And this means not only being honest with other people, but even more importantly, being honest with yourself. So when difficult situations arrive, difficult emotions arise, be honest with yourself about exactly what's going on. Problems in relationships. And even when good relationships come to an end, that's a problem as well. All sorts of conflicting emotions come up at that time. And the first question is, okay, what exactly is going on here? What are your emotions? Where do these things come from? You try to probe in. It's not just simply a matter of watching the emotion come and then watching it go, and then somehow it will just go away on its own. It doesn't work that way. You have to probe into it. You have to ask questions. And that's the next step, is learning how to ans ask the right questions. They basically come down to the question of what's skillful, what's not skillful. 
in this particular as cluster of emotions you have. And that relates even more as you carry it through, it relates to the Four Noble Truths. Because the unskillful part is whatever is causing suffering. And the skillful part is whatever leads you away from suffering. So, say when you have difficulties in a relationship, just look at, okay, what are the good parts and what are the bad parts there? What are the skillful parts of your feelings about this other person? And what are the parts that cause suffering? And remember the Buddha's analysis of suffering. Okay, there's clinging to the five aggregates. That's suffering. So where is the clinging in your relationship? Where is your clinging in your thoughts about the relationship? That's what you've got to look into. Now we've got a problem here that in English we talk about having feeling attachment for someone, and we tend to equate the attachment with a clinging. Well, that's not necessarily the case. When you feel strong attachment for another person, it's a whole cluster of emotions in there, and only one of them is clinging. There's affection, and that's a good thing. There's gratitude, that's a good thing. There's trust, sense of commitment, these are all good things. But when you pile clinging on top of it, it turns all these good things, even the good things can get turned into suffering. And then once this clinging, it leads to another part of attachment, which is emotional bias. You get, it becomes a slant in the way you look at things. So you have to learn how to take the emotion apart and see precisely where the clinging is, because that's what's causing the suffering. That's what you've got to work on. Now the texts say there are four kinds of clinging. And in terms of relationships, three of them are, re are relevant. One is just the fact that you get certain gratification out of the relationship. Certain desires you have are met. Physical or emotional or mental desires, whatever they are. And that's the sense where you begin to feed on that gratification. That's one aspect of clinging. Another, when they talk about clinging to rights and or precepts and practices, it's basically the habit patterns that you've got into in a particular relationship. And you cling to those as well. And the clinging here means that you, you base your happiness on them. You get to the point where you really feel you can't have any happiness without them. That's when the relationship turns into suffering, where your emotions about the relationship turn into suffering. And then there's finally your sense of self. So many of us define ourselves in terms of our relationships with other people. This person loves me, that person loves me. I can depend on this person. That person can depend on me. The I and the me that gets in there. And a lot of our sense of our, our good feelings about ourselves that depend on that I and me in terms of the relationship. Those are the things you have to watch out for, because these are the things that turn a relationship, even a good relationship, into, into suffering. When the relationship ends, for whatever the reason, that's why there's suffering that goes along with the grief. There's that passage we mentioned this afternoon, in where Sari Buddha talks about how he didn't see that any, that change, anything whose change would cause him a sense of disturbance in his mind. And the nun immediately counters with, well, what about if there were a change in the Buddha? What if the Buddha passed away? And the Sariputta would say, well, it would say, it's a shame that such a great being has passed away. A lot of people have been helped by him. It's a shame that more people can't be helped by him. But he said, I wouldn't feel any grief. And then on his response, is, well, that's a sign that there's no, no conceit in you. This is that fourth kind of, the, the last kind of clinging there, the sense of I of who you are that gets defined by the relationship. That's what causes a lot of the grief right there. And so it's important that we be honest with ourselves about that fact. That, yep, that's there. Then you start taking it apart, see how, how much you really believe in that. Because there's so much of the stuff that we have in our minds that we pick up from various places that we've never really examined, to see how much we want to identify with these things. If you identify with that sense of clinging, you're going to suffer. If you can look at the sense of clinging until you realize, well, there's nothing really there that's worth identifying with, then you can begin to let go of the craving that led to that clinging, because you see the, the drawbacks that it has. And again, 
end. This is where you bring whatever powers of concentration you have. I talked earlier about concentration being, means being on friendly terms with the present moment, having a place where you can feel that you can settle down and be at ease. They talk about concentration as being a vihara dhamma, which means a, a home for the mind, a place where the mind can retreat, gain strength, it can rest, gain nourishment. When you have a place like this within, then the kind of the weight that you tend to put on your relationships outside begins to grow lighter. In other words, you begin to look less and less for your happiness outside and look more and more inside for it. Because when your happiness is based on the inside like this, then it doesn't have to depend on taking anything from anyone else or requiring that anyone else be this way or that way. And that takes a huge load off of a relationship. And when that sense of clinging is gone, then the affection, the gratitude, the commitment, the trust that make a relationship a good thing, they, they no longer cause any suffering. So when difficult emotions arise like this, as we said, you can't wait until your virtue and concentration are totally equal to the task, but you take whatever virtue and concentration you have and use them to support your discernment, and learn how to ask questions about these emotions as they come in. The ability to ask questions about it means you can step back a little bit from the emotion. It's not that you're denying it, it's not that you're cutting yourself off from it, but it's just getting a little bit of perspective on what's going on, why you feel certain ways. One, be honest with yourself about how you feel, and then two, look into, well, why do I feel this way? What's the logic behind this? We tend not to think about logic in line with our emotions, but actually they do have a logic of their own. There are reasons for why you feel certain things, and you want to probe into those reasons to see exactly which reasons are worth abiding by and which ones are not. So you can start seeing through the emotion, saying, oh, well, this came from that assumption, and I don't really identify with that assumption anymore. That helps to loosen whatever painful emotion came from that. So one, it's this ability to be honest with yourself, and two, how to learn how to ask the right questions about what's going on. Try to think in terms of the Four Noble Truths. There's suffering. What's the suffering? Well, it's the clinging. What causes the suffering? It's the craving. So look for the clinging, look for the craving and try to use whatever powers of concentration you have to give the mind the strength it needs in order to really be patient and persistent in this practice of coming to an understanding about what's going on, and particularly why you're causing yourself unnecessary suffering. Because that's the real surprising discovery when you work with discernment, is you, there are certain sufferings that you just take for granted. They seem to be a part of your life, and you can't imagine living without them. And all of a sudden you begin to realize that it's not necessary. You don't have to suffer that way. It's just a lot of weird assumptions have come together in such a way that they're causing suffering. And when you see your own foolishness in allowing this to happen, this is why concentration is important. Most of us don't like to see our own foolishness. It will play it along with this assumption for so long. And part of me actually knew better, and yet I continue to play along. When you come to that realization, it's not, it's not an easy realization, but it is liberating when you realize, I don't need to do that anymore. So when difficult emotions come up in the practice, you, you can't run away from them. You can learn to turn and look right at them. And many times you'll be surprised that you really do have the, the tools you need, the weapons you need, the abilities you need are there. We often tend to underestimate ourselves when we face these things. But if we're really determined to work things through, you'll find that the strength and the tools you need are at hand. <laughs>